For the best part of an hour and a half, the two men sat opposite each other in a small, dimly lit room. They smoked, made small talk, did the crossword, and occasionally, as bouts of boredom took him, Johnny had a little snooze, as Albert kept him fed and watered with a steady supply of tea and toast. Earlier in the afternoon of Monday the 28th of February 1949, 39-year-old John George Haig, a respected director of an engineering firm, who was Johnny to his pals and Sonny to his beloved parents, had once again volunteered his time to assist the police following the disappearance of his good friend, co-tenant and prospective business partner, Mrs. Henrietta Duran Deacon, who he had reported missing. Interview room three of Chelsea Police Station was barely big enough for two men, let alone four. So being just eight foot square, with no windows, a small table, and only one door, as Chief Superintendent Thomas Barrett and Divisional Detective Inspector Shelley Symes had stepped away, Detective Inspector Albert Webb and Johnny Haig passed the time waiting their return. Johnny was an unassuming little fellow, five foot eight and ten stone as a push, with a weedy little body that a stiff breeze could easily blow over. Raised well, he was polite, calm and respectful. As a dapper middle-class gent, he was fastidiously neat, with shiny black shoes, a starred shirt and a smart brown suit, topped off with a red tie and socks as a bold flourish of colour. And although Johnny was just a few weeks away from his 40th birthday, he looked almost boyish, being blessed with a little round face, dimples in his cheeks, a side parting, and a feeble little moustache, who spoke well and never swore, but always at a slightly feminine pitch, as if his voice had never broken. Yes, it's fair to say that Johnny Haig was a pleasant sort of chap, who was unassuming, unthreatening, amiable, and easily forgettable. And although they couldn't prove it, the police suspected otherwise. Being locked in an airless box, a ticking clock, a numb bum, and Webb saying nothing, as years in the force had taught him the unsettling power of silence. At 7.15pm, Johnny piped up, What are they doing now? Symes and Barrett, I mean. Webb bluntly uttered, Well, John, I don't really know. But I should imagine they're working hard in order to get you hanged. Unperturbed, Johnny asked, Hanged? What on earth for? falling into the trap which Webb had set. Oh, you know very well that they only hang people for one reason in this country, don't you, John? Over the last five years, unassuming little Johnny Haig had befriended six wealthy persons, the Swan family, the Hendersons and Mrs. Duran Deacon. He had assumed their identities, inherited their estates, drained their assets and all six had mysteriously vanished, and almost no one had noticed. And as a cocky impish grin spread across his boyish face, and his eyes, like cold dark marbles, twinkled, Johnny smirked, You can't prove I murdered anybody. You can't prove a murder without a body. As with a callous coolness, the little killer quipped, you know those people that disappeared? They no longer exist. No trace of them will ever be found. And yet, right there, in interview room three at Chelsea Police Station, John George Haig, one of Britain's most infamous serial killers, would brazenly confess to six perfect murders. But without a body, the police could do nothing. Sulfuric. John George Haig was born on the 27th of April 1909, the only child of John and Emily Haig, a mining engineer and a housewife, 
who were both 37 years old, married for 11, and faithful right through their old age. Johnny's entrance into the world was unremarkable. Born in the bedroom of a small terraced house at 22 Kings Road in Stamford, Lincolnshire, a respectable upper working class street for the skilled and educated in a prosperous mining community. Although born a little undersized, his birth was uneventful. As a baby, he was no bother at all. He slept well, ate well, played quietly, rarely cried, and being blessed with no diseases, disabilities or deformities, his health was never an issue. In fact, as to be expected from a family with no history of drink or drugs, assaults or abuse, instability, insanity or incarceration, as a good boy who never had a tantrum, there were no significant events which troubled his early life. In 1910, the family moved to a larger home at 112 Ledger Lane in Outwood, north of Wakefield. And for the rest of their lives, they suffered no period of unemployment, poverty, depression or separation. As a boy, John wholeheartedly adopted his parents' beliefs by becoming a member of the Protestant nonconformist sect, the Plymouth Brethren, a small puritanical group with a strict moral code, a dour formal dress, and an unflinching politeness, who believed that the Bible was the word of God, so unless it is expressly stated, everything was forbidden, including Easter, Christmas, and wearing crucifixes. So devout were the Plymouth Brethren, they shunned anything that distracted them from serving God. Hence the Hague household was always neat, clean, but sparse. And with no radio, newspapers or books, except the Bible, they kept their minds pure, their hearts innocent, and all sins at a distance. And to ensure this, hospitality was forbidden, friends were limited to those of their tiny congregation, and John Sr., built an eight-foot wall around their back garden to shield them from any outside influences. It may seem severe, but Johnny embraced his faith, which stayed with him for most of his life. To any outsiders, although the Hagues bristled with an unpleasant air of superiority, often being cold, aloof, distant, and quite snooty, by living closer to the Bible, they never intended to offend anyone. All John and Emily Haig ever wanted was to serve God and to do the best for their son. Age seven, Johnny went to prep school. Being a little boy, dressed in smart suits, shiny shoes and bow ties, he was often bullied. But buoyed by his faith, he brushed off these insults without any emotion. Aged 11, Johnny won a prestigious scholarship to Wakefield Grammar, a Church of England school attached to Wakefield Cathedral. And although its teachings conflicted with their strict religious beliefs, having become an altar boy, a chorister, and an organist having learned the piano, his loving parents were so proud that they fully supported him right through his education. And because of that, it served him well. During those awkward teenage years, Johnny remained an even-tempered boy who didn't shout, swear, smoke or drink. But he had no issues with those who did. He didn't fight, start fires, steal and had no sexual issues. In fact, although a late bloomer, he later became celibate, fearing the rampant rise of sexual diseases and seeing women more as companions than conquests. And being an only child, with very few friends, he had a puppy who he adored. Although lonely, Johnny was a good talker and a keen listener. He was a regular churchgoer and an enthusiastic student at the school science club who was fascinated by machinery and chemistry. And as a bright but easily bored boy, although he won prizes in geography and divinity, his grades were not good. So for fear of upsetting his proud parents and eager to please them, 
he forged his schoolmaster's handwriting, creating glowing reports which fooled everyone. Upon graduation, Johnny failed to pass his school certificate. But John and Emily Haig weren't upset or even disappointed. Yes, he had lied, but they had raised a good, decent and moral boy of above average intelligence, who dressed well, spoke politely and dreamed of a career in engineering. And no matter what path he took in life, they knew that their little boy would always excel at his chosen profession. And yet, for the first 27 years of his life, as a decent human being, Johnny had achieved a lot. But as one of Britain's most infamous serial killers, John George Haig had done nothing. Twelve years and six deaths later, Johnny Haig, the entrepreneur, who lived in a Kensington hotel, drove a red sports car, wore silk shorts under his sharp suits, and was a tad miffed at not only missing luncheon, but also tiffin, tea, and now his dindins, sat in interview room three of Chelsea Police Station, flanked by Barrett, Symes, and Webb. Three shabbily dressed coppers, whose hand-rolled tobacco, stale sweaty suits, and cheap shop-bought aftershave was an insult to his more refined sense of smell. And as Johnny candidly talked, the police listened. I've made some statements to you about the disappearance of Mrs. Duran Deacon. The truth is, we left the hotel together, and she was inveigled by me into going to Crawley, having taken her into the storeroom at Leopold Road. While she was examining some paper for use as fingernails, I shot her in the back of the head. Throughout, although he was polite, calm and controlled, his boyish face beamed with a cockiness, as being pleased as punch at his own superiority over the police. He knew he could tell them everything, but without a body, they could prove nothing. From his teens to his twenties, Johnny worked as a salesman at Shell Max, a sign company rep, and as an insurance clerk, where he learned the final legal points of higher purchase agreements. But finding the long hours, hard graft and tiny wage unrewarding, his work record was only described as satisfactory. And why wouldn't it? As an easily distracted dreamer, with wide eyes and high hopes, his commute from his sparse, starchy and silent home to the bustling city of Leeds in the grip of the Roaring Twenties must have felt like the boy had entered a brave new world. A sensual orgy of dizzying delights, fizzing with fast cars, fine foods, gangster films and filthy lucre. Everything he had been denied. But as a teetotal celibate, Johnny didn't descend into debauchery as his only vice was pride. Fueled by middle-class aspirations, he dressed in smart suits, neat like his mother made, but topped off with a flash of red as a tiny act of rebellion. He brought a wireless radio. Shocking, I know, but he didn't besmirch his ears by listening to anything vulgar like jazz, only classical, which his father approved of. Yes, he secretly owned three cars, a Ford 8, a Talbot Dirac, and an Alfa Romeo, which he and his pals raced from Leeds to Scarborough. Okay, he dabbled a tad at the horse track, but only because he loved the thought of making oodles of cash without the hard graft. And yes, okay, although he was never charged, his dismissal from the sign company did coincide with the theft of a petty cash box, which he apologised for, and his father paid back all of the missing monies. So considering how his life had begun, surely these were nothing but little acts of indiscretion, which were forgiven and forgotten. On the 6th of July 1934, a little later than most men, 27-year-old Johnny Haig married 23-year-old Beatrice Hamer, 
a pretty blonde waitress he had met just a few months prior. But this wasn't love. Johnny didn't feel love. After a quickie service at Bridlington Registry Office, with no wedding bells, no bridesmaids, no cards, no confetti, no readings, no religion, one witness and no parents, Johnny and Beatrice Haig moved into their own home in Leeds. But this wasn't a marriage. Johnny didn't do marriage. Although a pleasant companion, Beatrice was more of a convenience to free the boy from the austere shackles of his stifling parents. And although, as they always did, his parents forgave him, being burdened by responsibilities, his wife was now little more than an impediment to his dreams of prosperity. Scraping by on a paltry three pounds a week was no way for a budding entrepreneur to live. How on earth could Johnny be seen as a real go-getter when he never stayed in swanky hotels, rarely ate prime rib steak, his suits were so last season, his blasted bank balance was always bled dry, and he only owned three sports cars? No, this would not do. Not by a long shot. On the 28th of June 1934, just one week before his wedding, having perfected the skill of forging a stranger's handwriting and mastering the finer legal points of higher purchase agreements, in a simple scam where they resold rented cars on forged papers, Johnny and two cohorts defrauded three insurance firms out of £960, almost £60,000 today. In his eyes, it was a victimless crime. I mean, he wasn't snatching old ladies' handbags, breaking into young mum's homes, or scaring the bejesus out of bank tellers with dicky hearts. He didn't use a gun, he used a pen. And let's not forget, no one was hurt and nobody died. So really, what harm was done? On the 22nd of November 1934, at Leeds Assizes, John George Haig was found guilty of three counts of fraud, with six similar counts taken into consideration, and he was sentenced to 15 months in prison. After six months, Beatrice gave birth to a baby girl, who she named Pauline. But as a penniless single mother, with a convict spouse, who made no provisions for his wife and his alleged child, so unable to cope, Pauline was put up for adoption. Life in prison was fine. The bedding was subpar, the uniform was baggy, and the food was far from filet mignon. But Johnny made do by keeping his cell neat, his mind busy, his nose clean, and devoting his time to prayer, education, and silent reflection. And although an amiable little fellow, whose charm made him an easily likable sort. Johnny wasn't a lowlife like the common criminals he had been banged up with. No, his crimes had style, finesse, and just like him, they were superior in every way. His only remorse was for everything that he had lost. His money, his suits, his cars, and his reputation. On the 8th of December 1935, Johnny was released from prison. Having unburdened himself of a wife and a child, he returned home to his loving parents, who would always support him through each test and trial, always forgave him for every sin and sentence, and always stood by him, even as, shamefully, their convict son was excommunicated from the Plymouth Brethren. And with his faith shattered, his heart stabbed, and his pockets empty. John George Haig had reached rock bottom. Throughout his full and rather frank confession, in the stale, smoky confines of interview room three, as the self-confessed serial killer spoke, Barrett, Symes and Webb listened intently. But never once did little Johnny Haig stutter, flush or tremble. His voice never raised, and sweat never broke, as the only emotion he showed 
was a cocky little grin as he corrected the copper's mistakes. It seemed odd, didn't it, that a former member of the Plymouth Brethren would smoke Galois from something as ostentatious as an 18 karat gold cigarette box. That a fastidiously neat man would allow odd singe marks to sully the underside wrists of his tailored overcoat. And that such a slight and unassuming man could physically kill six people and leave no evidence with which to convict him. And yet Haig ploughed on. Mrs. Duran Deacon no longer exists. She has disappeared completely, and no trace of her can ever be found. Deliberately leaving a prolonged pause, so Detective Inspector Webb could ask the obvious. Well, what happened to her? He grinned. I destroyed her with acid. You will find the sludge, all that remains of her, and my storeroom in Leopold Road. Every trace has gone. I did the same with the Hendersons and the McSwans. Which posed the police with a real conundrum. If a body no longer exists, how can you prove a murder if the murdered is only missing? Post-prison, Johnny felt like a lost cause. He was too old to be living at home, too sinful to be welcomed back to the church, too solitary to be part of a criminal gang, and as a late twenties, unemployed ex-con, dossing in his elderly parents' home in a small mining town in the north of England. Now, more than ever, he was further away from his dream. In 1936, eager for a fresh start, Johnny moved to London. Dabbling in a few honest, but ultimately unrewarding jobs, including as a clerk and chauffeur for a good egg called William Donald McSwan Jr. But hating the long hours, hard graft and tiny wage, once again, Johnny felt the lure of easy money. On the 24th of November 1937, Haig was convicted of seven counts of fraud, having forged legal papers and stole £3,200 almost £210,000 today. His confidence was high, his scheme was clever, and his crime was brazen. But his mistake wasn't greed, but speed, as on the letterhead, he had misspelt the town of Guildford. Johnny was sentenced to four years in Wandsworth Prison. Wealth was within a fingertip's touch. Yes, being banged up was a minor setback, But once again, his near-perfect plan was scuppered by those unpredictable irritants. People. As whatever he stole, they would always want it back. But how could he make sure that they would never notice the missing monies? Released on license on the 13th of August 1940, the 31-year-old repeat offender returned to London only to see a ravaged smoking city. Its blackened, crumbling buildings, silhouetted by a red fiery sea, as if he had entered the bowels of hell, as night after night, his whole world was bombed by the Luftwaffe. Buildings were destroyed, homes were smashed, lives were decimated, and as a ragged and hungry Hague slept in a flea-infested Doss house, the strict conditions of his early release was like walking a legal tightrope, Ex-con Johnny had to go straight, as one little slip and he was back in the slammer. Only, like Leeds as a boy, although London was a true den of debauchery, still being a teetotal celibate with dreams of becoming an entrepreneur, even at wartime, London was a city of extremes, with blackouts, bomb craters and Bentleys, furs, famine and finger food, destitution, decadence, and death. As part of his parole, Johnny did his bit for the war effort by being conscripted as a fire watcher, alerting the fire brigade to any art treasures at risk of destruction by the Blitz. Again, the hours were long, the work was hard, and as he protected masterpieces worth a mint, he did it all for a paltry wage. And like most citizens, 
His wartime experience was not without its horrors. In a regular letter to his beloved parents, Johnny wrote, On one occasion, whilst on fire watching duty, I was talking to a Red Cross nurse at the warden's post. The sirens shrieked, bombs dropped, and the nurse and I moved off to our places of duty. Suddenly, in a moment of premonition, I knew that a bomb would fall close by. So I dodged into a doorway and awaited the inevitable crash. It came with a horrifying shriek. And as I staggered up, bruised and bewildered, a head rolled against my foot. The nurse, who but a few moments before had been gay and full of life, high ideals and a sense of duty, had in one instant been swept into eternity. But as shocking as it was, the reality was this. In wartime, sometimes people just disappear. Johnny did his damnedest to go straight and to make his parents proud. On and off for four years, he worked as a clerk for his old pal William McSwan, whose kindness always saw him through, and did odd jobs for a solid chap called Alan Stevens, a mechanical engineer and owner of the Union Road Tool and Garage Company in Crawley, working at his workshop, clearing out his storeroom, and living in his family home with his wife Evelyn and his daughter Barbara. Johnny had landed on his feet. Except, putting up, getting by, and making do was never Johnny's style. So on the 11th of June 1941, once again, he was sentenced to 21 months' hard labour. But not for a cunningly superior scam, having embezzled an impossible fortune, ripped from the mega-rich, having faultlessly defrauded the insured, using a litany of faultless forgeries. No. Strapped for cash, Johnny had illegally flogged off an old fridge, five bunk beds, and 60 yards of cloth. And in prison once again, because of these crimes, he had been branded a petty criminal. On the 17th of September 1943, he was released on license and went back to square one. Or so it seemed. When I first discovered that there were easier ways of making a living, I did not ask myself whether I was doing right or wrong. That seemed to be irrelevant. I merely said, that is what I wish to do. And as a means lay within my power, that was what I decided. If you're going to go wrong, go wrong in a big way. Go after women, rich old women, who like a bit of flattery, that's your market. By his release, Johnny had spent six of his 34 years in several prisons, including Wandsworth, Dartmoor, Chelmsford and Lincoln. Lincoln. Ah, oh, Lincoln. The worst prison I have ever known is Lincoln. I resented it most bitterly, and made up my mind, after that, that there would be no more inside for me. But unlike the petty pilferers and common criminals who frittered the endless hours, days and weeks by pinching snout, blagging sweets and smuggling smokes in a stash of old socks, Johnny dreamed big. As his cellmate in Chelmsford later said, He said he'd aim for half a million quid before he'd quit. But everyone just took that as a joke. Another bunk buddy said, He kept gabbling on about this corpus delicti, so that's what we named him. Corpus delicti, an 18th century English law, also known as the bloodless murder law, states that, without a body, there can be no crime. But around these two little words, his master plan was born. The problem was, it's almost impossible to make a body completely disappear. Prisoner Haig was an unassuming little fellow, petite, polite and polished, who devoted his time inside to being an altar boy and organist in the chapel. He starched his shirts, he made his bed 
and always with a please and a thank you, Johnny was charm personified. So being a bright but easily bored boy who once excelled in the school science club, he was given a much lauded job in the prison workshop. When he wasn't spending long hours cutting fresh tin into prison cutlery, zinc plating handles onto kitchen pans, and cleaning rusted iron with sulfuric acid, which stripped his soft skin to a red raw mess and stunk his nose with noxious choking odors. That aside, the prison workshop was the perfect place to fill the endless hours as his restless hands and curious mind fixed, fiddled, and tinkered. Here, his entrepreneurial spirit truly flourished. And yet, never once did he make, mold, or even invent a single thing that would make his fortune. No, but it was here that he devised the final piece of his grand plan. In 1944, John George Haig was back on the streets, a small, thin ex-con with a weedy frame, a boyish face, a feminine voice, a charming smile, and a truly ludicrous dream to become rich. Only he had no money, no home, no skills, and he knew almost no one. For the first 27 years of his life, unassuming little Johnny Haig was little more than a lost boy eager to please his parents. Over the next eight years, he was nothing but a failed petty fraudster who at every turn had lost everything. He didn't drink, smoke or swear. He wasn't violent or sadistic. But between 1944 and 1945, he would befriend six wealthy persons, the Swan family, the Hendersons and Mrs. Duran Deacon. And with near perfect precision, he would assume their identities, inherit their estates, drain their assets and all six victims would mysteriously vanish, leaving no trace with which to convict him. John George Haig would become one of Britain's most infamous serial killers. And it all began with a dead mouse. Friends, Thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. That was part one of Sulfuric, the true story of John George Haig, with the second part of six continuing next week. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Jane Heath and Miss Marston, a.k.a. Sandra. With, as always, a big thank you to everyone who has taken the time to like, share, comment, and review this small independent podcast. It's very much appreciated. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. That wasn't too bad, actually. That was not too bad. Oh, dear Lord. Oh, God. Oh, I was a beast. Right. <sighs> Ladies and gentlemen. A moment you've all been waiting for was finally here. Extra mile is back. Extra mile is back, everyone. Hey, you can all cheer. You can all get excited. Extra mile's back. We're back. Actually, murder mile's back. Extra mile's back. I mean, I know everyone cares more about extra mile. Why? 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 The bit you just listened to is the hard bit. This is the easy bit. This is piece of piss. The first bit was the hard bit. This is the easy bit. Uh, we're back. Extra mile's here. Uh, how are you all? Are you all well? It's been a while, isn't it? It's been a, it's been a as they say, a New York minute. Uh, I don't know whether that means long or short. I don't know. I don't don't message me. I don't care. Uh, I just, I just, just something I said off the top of my head. I don't need to know about it. I'll email. I'll, I'll, I'll Google it afterwards. Uh, we're back. It's been about. It's been six weeks, hasn't it? It's been six weeks. So before we start, you're probably all gripped and got your cup of tea in your hand ready. I'm making a cup of tea. Yay! It's everyone's favourite part of the show. 
when I make a cup of tea and I'm opening a window as well because it's bloody 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 it's uh it's very cold outside it's about two degrees today so it's just just above freezing um, it's almost cold enough for me to put the uh, the fire on so I think I might do that this weekend I haven't done that yet because I'm too tight-fisted uh, but inside is full of condensation uh, so I'm making a cup of tea uh, that's on the go at the moment, so you'll hear it boiling a bit. Uh, no biscuits, no biscuits. Eight weeks into the diet, it's going well. well since the uh, uh, since the the wedding incident where I couldn't put my suit on, that was a bit embarrassing. So yeah, uh, I've been really good. No chocolate at all. No chocolate. No biscuits. Uh, pretty much nothing that's got. Uh, fat in it or extra sugar or any of that just lots of fruit and vegetables and uh, vegetables uh, almost no cake uh, I, I've, I've had two Belgian buns but only only because one the place I'm in at the moment has a, has a Percy Ingalls around the corner that I sometimes nip into and uh, they do a nice Belgian bun but also I previously when I was doing the mini miles actually you know when I was researching this uh, I was in the place the, the nice uh, uh, Russian Orthodox Jewish neighborhood which has the really really nice bakery which has the really nice Belgian buns which has the kind of the lining of decent like good icing good cake good glassy cherry but also a really nice lining of uh, uh cinnamon on the inside it's really nice so i had one of those that was very nice it wasn't as exciting as i was hoping for joe because i had no cake for a long time uh but uh yeah when i had it i was like yeah it was nice but i was like it wasn't it's weird it's if i if i have anything that's a little bit too fatty now my stomach because i've got hernia anyway my stomach really lets me know about it so but the diet's going well um uh, Belly's practically gone. It's amazing if you cut wheat out of your diet. Wheat's out of my diet. Dairy's mostly out of my diet as well. So my belly's practically disappeared. Uh, I can feel the fat coming off my face. Uh, so it's it's less moon face now. Um, uh, but also, you know, the weight always goes off bad places. Well, like it's it's going off my arse. My arse is disappearing. The love handles have gone. They've gone, which is great. But my arse is disappearing. So I'm having to I'm having to make extra holes on my belt. So you know. You know the diet's going well then when the belt's slipping off, but it's good. I don't I don't feel hungry. I eat all my vitamins and minerals, and it, you know I, I look forward to my meals every day. Nice nice mackerels and uh, kippers. I've been eating bassa, uh, which is a, a kind of a Vietnamese fish. Uh, it's nice. It's like it's a cross between cod and kippers, but it's kind of a nice go between. It's very nice. So that's been really good. Um, uh, it's uh, start of November here. Uh, I think this is the 7th of November today, I think. Uh, so, yeah, boat has been uh, readied for winter already. Uh, had my new covers done. It was over summer. Got all my coal for winter. Uh, I spent the summer, even on the hottest days when it was 38 degrees, I went to Poundland and bought all my cheapy logs. So I've got hundreds of cheapy logs. I've got all my kindling, got all my fire lighters, got all my newspapers. Stocked up with uh, fuel. So I did my fuel this week. Got all my uh, gas. Because obviously, you know, you live on a boat, these things you have to find, which is good. Uh, only downside is my generator blew the other day, which was really annoying. So uh, I'm getting that fixed today, hopefully. But, I've, but, but, whoa, me splashing out, I bought a new generator as well. So that turns up next week, which will be good. So there can be no break. Because yesterday was a bit embarrassing. I, I, I was having problems with the engine. So I had to, because I need to charge up my laptop, I had to put my. Uh, power cable through my window into my neighbor's boat so he could plug it into his power so I could power my laptop otherwise I wouldn't have been able to finish writing the episode so uh, uh, yeah so that's the, the, the curse of being on a boat sometimes is you can't always get you can't always get power so yeah that was good uh, just making my tea a nice PG cup of tea you can't have, can have a proper PG two sugars I'm having my sugars, even though it's refined sugar and you're not really meant to have that, I'm I'm having it in my tea, I don't care about that. And I might treat myself in a bit and have a packet of quavers, ooh, excitement. I like quavers, they're slightly addictable. If you haven't tried them, they're basically not crisps, they're really just, they're really just the leftover starch from other crisps. But it's like some of the best things in life, like uh, Joe Quavers. 
uh, what is it, walkers who make them, they, they make all their crisps and then that's the starch that's left over and then basically they just boil up the starch and put air into it and then we eat that, they put a cheese flavour with it and everyone goes, ooh, yummy, it's delicious. And they are very nice, but it is, it's just starch. It's like ginger nuts, ginger nuts biscuits are the leftover biscuits from all other biscuits which are put into a big vat and they, the reason why it's ginger is because ginger disguises all the flavour of the, all, the, all the other biscuits. And it's brown, they add a brown colouring. That disguises all the horrible colours as well. It's, but it's a nice biscuit. Uh, oh, I miss biscuits. Getting ready for Christmas. Christmas coming up, so I'll be able to pig out soon. I'm looking forward to that. I'm going to be on the boat for Christmas Day. It's my. I, I normally go away for Christmas, but this year I've decided to have Christmas on the boat. I have, so I can decorate. I've never decorated the boat. I can decorate the boat. Uh, I'm going to have some nice treats, some movies. Uh, I'm probably going to do something that I want to do, which is I want to go in the middle of oxford circus on christmas day and just stand there because no one will be there it'll be like i've got the whole city to myself i'm looking forward to that silly things like that and then i'll probably go have a nice meal somewhere uh i think if if some friends are local i'll meet up with them for some uh one or two cheeky beers uh but that'll be it that'll be good fun so um this is the multi-parter this is a six-parter i mentioned this at the start i've already pre-planned this unlike the other ones like blackout ripper or reg christie do you know uh I kind of, you know, they expanded as they went along, but these, I think, are, I've kind of really focused over the year of what needs to be in this episode, uh, and I know it's a six-parter, uh, so that's good. Hopefully, the, your final part will be on Boxing Day, uh, so I'm powering ahead at the moment to make sure that I'm finished. I need to get this finished by the 21st, so I can get some time off, otherwise I, I don't want to be working Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. Uh, and then there will be the uh, obviously the the omnibus editions which are the bits without the extra mile and all the crap that's in it and it's just so you if you want to if you if you just want to listen right through there'll be the omnibus editions and then at the end of this to end this season i'm doing another q a so uh ask me any questions uh what you can do uh on any of the social media forums you can post me a question that's not a problem at all and i'll i'll try and add it in i can't guarantee to do everyone's questions but i'll try my best so you can either uh message me on social media you could email me or if you want to here's an idea because everyone's got phones anyway um you've all got kind of voice recorders on them or whatever um record me a short message keep it really short like 30 seconds less uh, otherwise i'm gonna have to edit it down um uh, uh, and then you can either email it to me that might be a problem because it could be a big file or if it's a large file put it in a dropbox send me a link or there's a there's a nice free app. you can use it it's an app it's online it's called we transfer we transfer is really easy you don't have to sign up to anything you just download it um it it lets you upload stuff and send it to people via a link it's really useful and then you know uh, a week later it deletes deletes it so it's not using up a lot of data so it's yes yeah, so that's very good so you can do that so dropbox me or we transfer or uh email me or you know whatever but yeah if you have any questions please do let me know uh so i'm planning the year ahead that's done i've worked out all of the there's about 50 cases that i want to cover ish next year obviously some of them will fall by the wayside uh so i'll be having a little bit of time off in january and then i'm looking forward to getting back into the archives so i'm going to try and make sure that i give myself at least two weeks off because i never properly take time off so i'm gonna uh, that's gonna be january time off and then middle of january into the archives be about four or five maybe six weeks in the archives then we'll be back with the new season of murder mile all very exciting don't go anywhere don't don't leave me <laughs> um just to say uh thanks to everyone who's uh, i've met on my tours that's been really nice to meet listeners coming along uh really nice to meet you in person uh hope you enjoyed the tour uh, just to point out when people do come on the tours don't expect the same as the podcast the tour was created first so it's a very different beast you, you the, the tour is not me show, showing you sites that you would see on the podcast although if you tell me that you are a listener i will point them out to you uh but there will hopefully be a tour soon that i'm hoping to create which will be a kind of just a, a for people who listen to the podcast it'll be like a walk around soho fitzrovia other places and i can point out locations and we can have a little bit and it'll be a kind of freewheeling kind of chat about it uh, but the if you come on murder while it is very different from the podcast so don't expect the same 
it's it's a different beast it's got its own kind of rhythm and things like that and it, it was created it was created four years ago so uh, unlike the podcast which has evolved that's very much it's very much as it was kind of four years ago but you know shorter shorter better uh so uh what else do i need to say i'm gonna have a bit i'm gonna turn away but i'm gonna have a slurp of tea quiet slurp because i know people hate slurping and mouthy noises i totally agree with you uh so uh, th- uh, this file was in the archives the john george haig file um that was very good i enjoyed finding that it was just nice to touch the pages and kind of go through it there's loads of crime scene photos on there uh which were great and loads of documents uh which i'd never seen before there's loads in the metropolitan archive as well you've got the crime museum archive as well there's loads of different places where i've been able to get sources for this so it's been really useful um I'll be posting a lot of uh, crime scene photos on the Patreon account, so you can subscribe to that. It's just like three dollars a month. Nothing, nothing. That's not even the cost of a Belgian bun. Um, uh, I'll be posting a few online, uh, not not many, but a few. Obviously, the patrons kind of, you know, uh, their uh, subscription actually. Uh, funds the bulk of the the money to keep uh, murder mile alive at the moment so that's that's really invaluable at the moment even though i can't transfer it across at the moment it's really weird i'm paying tax on it but i can't transfer it from patreon to here because it's in us dollars sorry americans close your ears uh, and the us dollar is really shitty at the moment uh, the, the pound should be shitty but i mean it is shitty but in the exchange rate it's like i lose money transferring it so literally that money is i, I can't take it out of there it's sitting there oh it's so infuriating uh I, i'm waiting for the point when the you know it's all changes and then you know i can make more money off this at the moment i'm losing money with it being uh, in dollars uh but that's patron that's patron for anyway but that's that's helping keep a murder mile alive that's nice that's uh that's very useful so uh all of that will be on there uh obviously i've got my youtube channel so you can go on there there will be the the usual videos on there uh and i've gone back to my old way of putting the full transcripts of the episode on the blogs now uh i took them off before for uh, uh reasons uh, <laughs> uh but uh, it, it just feels better having them back on there so you know i'll i'll, I'll deal with that um this episode is going out uh, about six weeks before Christmas-ish. Uh, I've just got a load of new uh, Murder Mile mugs in, which is very exciting. So uh, if you want to order a Murder Mile mug for yourself or for a friend or whatever, that's all good. I can get those out to you. Uh, uh, in the UK, they take a couple, uh, like uh, two days to deliver. If there's America or anyone else, it normally takes seven, uh, like five to seven working days. Uh, uh and i'm working on some new designs as well with uh with my my my, my good friend mr mr rushdie um he's done two already there's two more coming i'm gonna i'm gonna work on them in january when i've got some time off uh along with oh uh, lots of other things oh, God, it's gonna be so busy in january i know i'm saying i'm taking time off i don't i literally yeah it's probably not gonna happen is it uh but but not writing a podcast will be very beneficial so uh, what else is happening soon? I've just got my invite to the Acast Christmas party. Mm, that's going to be exciting. End uh, mid mid to end of Jan, uh, November. So uh, we will see if they have any uh, vodka jelly shot, cocaine, nudie sumo roller coasters. I bet there will be. Uh, so right, this episode. How long have we done? I'm just checking. Right, okay. I'm just trying to make sure I don't do too much on Extra Mile. Uh, I'm not going to give away too much in here because uh, obviously we've got another five episodes to go, so I don't want to add any spoilers in. But there, I, obviously, you would have noticed that I've deliberately tried to make this episode very different from the Blackout Ripper, different from the Reg Christie, but also different from the regular Murder Mile episodes as well. So there are things in there that you, well, I say this, I haven't edited it yet, you know. Uh, you've listened to the edited version i haven't because i haven't done it yet uh but i've tried to make it very different because obviously sulfuric is meant to be a very different kind of uh, its own beast in its own different way so uh there's no kind of um location introduction that i'd normally do where i'm kind of make a couple of jokes about a location but really i'm describing the location and things like that but what i decided to do with this one um even though they all have their own individual location that's mentioned um they're just really a reference now so 
uh, Chelsea Police Station. Uh, if you go on to either my YouTube account or any of the social media, you'll see the video there. Chelsea, Chelsea Police Station is there. It's at number two Lucan Place, SW3 in Chelsea. Uh, it's a five-story building. It looks kind of fortress-like. It's on a corner. There's a big kind of door. Above it would have been the usual police lamp, one of the blue ones. Uh, it's brown brick on the first of the third floors. The ground is stone and then there's a slate roof. Uh, it basically covers the equivalent of a square block. It's pretty big. Um, but it was, uh, unfortunately, like a lot of police stations, uh, because of because of uh, successive governments who have not been very good, uh, and uh, we won't mention about a certain Home Secretary who later became Prime Minister, who uh, got rid of a lot of the police uh, because she was making cutbacks, and then, uh, you know, she decided to complain that there was too much crime on the streets. Mm, I wonder why. Uh, so as one of the many police stations that have been shut down along with police being laid off in London, which is why you rarely see, see policemen anymore, uh, this was one of the locations that was sold off, which was Chelsea Police Station. And as as you would expect, guess what it's been turned into? Flats. Yes, of course it is. It's been turned into posh flats. But there's a dispute going on at the moment with the neighbours because it's surrounded by flats at the moment. And uh, uh, so, so currently it's being uh, used by guardian uh, uh, guardians who kind of live there cheaply. I used to do this years ago, live there cheaply until it's turned into what it's meant to be. Uh, they've been quite lucky. It's, uh, it's been in dispute for about about four years now. So they've lived there without any real problems, which is great. Um, so that's that. You can see that location on the line. I'll put some pictures on there as well. Uh, we will be doing the, the all of the murder locations, and I've got some great murder location uh, crime scene photos uh, that I'll be uh, using as well. But they, we won't go into those locations first. We've got a couple that we need to clear first to get all of the characters in. Um, and before you ask, if anyone's if anyone's wondering why I'm not calling this story spoilers, why I'm not calling this a story or John George Haig I'm not referring to him as the acid bath murderer which many people do spoilers uh that's because it's incorrect uh, I'm not going to go into details you'll learn more about that now but I've always had a problem with the fact that people call him the acid bath murderer it's not a bath it's a it's like a drum but obviously people hate the word drum so oh, it's just it's just little details like that really piss me off so every time someone uses the word acid bath murderer it's lazy have a go at them say look it's wrong it's incorrect uh also he's a serial killer he's not a murderer do you know well he is do you know it's the same thing but really it should be a lot clearer so that's why that's why i spent a long time trying to work out what to call this episode and that's why i decided to just call it sulfuric which i think is a nice Nice name, and hopefully the little new interstitials that I, I, I've I've written in here. I, as I was writing it, I was like, "Ooh, it'd be nice if here I just had, I just had something that just instead of going, uh, you know, the three tone, the cult with no name three tone that I use from Man in a Bag, I thought I'd have a something different here that would just go sulfuric, just kind of, and then you get, hopefully hopefully you hear a bit of a fizzing sound, but I don't know because I haven't edited it yet. That will be today and tomorrow and probably Sunday. Oh, this is going to be a bitch to edit, uh, especially as my uh, the, the narration cut out halfway through. I was recording this and I went to check it and I went, oh, shit. And all of a sudden, part of my narration had disappeared. Let's check it. It hasn't done it again. No, it's still going. Good. But half of it had disappeared. And I don't know why. So it was really, really, really annoying. Right. Not going to give away too much about what happens in the story, but let's uh, dive in quickly to some details about John George Haig. Some of them are, is already in the script that I've put in there, um, but obviously I'm going to start editing now, so some of this might disappear. So let's let's just plough through and see what there is. There might be things that are interesting. Okay, his full name was John George Haig. Obviously, his father was John as well. Uh, his parents Nick, uh, called him Sonny. Uh, but he preferred to call himself Johnny. He also calls himself Jack, as many people do who are called John. He was five foot eight slash nine. There's a bit of a disparity between his height. Uh, he was 150 pounds. Oh, we know that. Well, that, that was his weight when he died. Um, uh, I can't remember. So that's uh, that's about uh, just over 10 stone. He was slim, small framed, described as small, dapper and attentive. With cold, marble-like brown eyes, uh, he was small, not imposing, not strong or physical. He was always polite, fastidiously neat, always wear uh, shiny shoes, had creases in his trousers, 
smart ties, matching socks. His had his haircut done every week. He was always clean shaven, always charming. Uh, spoke, didn't really have much of an accent. Uh, I've added a little bit of a kind of slash northern twang slash London twang in here. I've let it move a little bit. Uh, we've got no actual recording of his voice. So what I've done is I've based this on what people have said. Uh, they said his voice was slightly higher pitched than normal, a little bit of feminine, had tendency to, he spoke well, but you could tell that there, you could tell his origins were there. Um, and it was slightly nasal as well. Uh, so uh, what I've tried to do is I've tried to recreate a version on there. As I did with the Red, Red Christie, I tried to uh, base it on what people had said. Uh... Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, so, uh, as mentioned, born 27th of April 19, uh, 1909 in Stamford, unremarkable birth, uh, born at home. Uh, his parents had been married uh, quite a few years. He was an only child. Um, good parents, mining engineer. Um, they had aspirations to be middle class, which was kind of ironic given the fact that they were Ply Plymouth. Plymouth. Oh, this is, I've struggled with it throughout this whole record. Plymouth Brethren really hard thing to say struggled throughout uh so even though they they kind of renounced uh mod mod uh, things that were modern and kind of technology and kind of anything that would dissuade them away from serving god deep down they had a kind of a, a middle class uh desire a desire to be respectable and middle class which kind of goes against what they were really doing the kind of the the austerity of it but you know that that kind of bled into him as well uh, as mentioned, though, he went to uh, uh, a Church of England school, which was uh, attached to Wakefield Cathedral. Uh, he wasn't uh, he was intelligent, but bored. Uh, he was good at geography and divinity. He worked uh, in the science club. He was really keen on chemistry and engineering. He loved mechanics. He did a talk about the history of submarines. Uh, these were his things. Uh, he really loved uh, just like his father, he just, even though they they didn't have radios. His father loved classical music. He loved classical music as well. So he loved Wagner and Mozart and Tchaikovsky. Hated jazz. Really hated jazz. Said it was said it was uh, vulgar. Uh, but would later go on to love things like obviously opera, ballet, classical con concerts. He was really really kind of focused on uh, being middle class. That's his whole things. But unlike most serial killers, this is really what episode one is about. You probably listen to it and you go, "Oh, where's the murder?" That's deliberately what I've done is that I've deliberately with this episode, instead of doing it like I did with the others, like where you see the victim, 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 victim. Then at the end, we learn why, where they started from. And I thought with John George Haig, because because his life at the start is so unremarkable, I thought it was better just to we'll do it this way. So in, so what I've done, if you if you listen very carefully, hopefully you've picked it up. But, you know, if not, this whole episode is about basically I've sat down and gone through Everything that you would assume uh, would be there with a serial killer in their early life. So, do you know, there's no abuse, there's no alcohol, there's no drugs. His parents stayed together. They were really supportive. He was religious, but not not fundamentalist. He's kind of he wavered through religion quite a lot. Uh, he wasn't called animals. He loved animals. Um, he had no sexual uh, perversions or predilections. In fact, he was celibate for quite a long uh, while. He was in a, a, a brief affair for a bit. Uh, in his early 20s but after that he was like it, that was actually one of his first court cases it was thrown out uh, but he was named in the court case uh, and he basically became celibate after that uh, no history of violence no history of insanity or depression in the family uh, he, he had no health problems at all he wasn't deformed in any way he had no diseases he had no disabilities Do you know there's literally nothing there that would, he, he was he was bullied a bit um his uh some of his flatmates just because he he had kind of uh smaller eyes they referred to him as chink uh as in kind of reference to uh, uh chinese people oh oh the early 1900s weren't they funny uh but do you know he batted this off um he was quite unemotional people said he, you know, he never he never shouted never got upset never really got happy he was quite an unemotional person so that's really all you see there as you kind of going through his life uh, some things were in there that I kind of decided not to put in in the end because you really can't. The problem with a lot of these details about his early life is that he said them. Or even worse, this is what I've tried to avoid as well, is quite a few of his friends would say, 
oh yeah he was uh oh yeah he was always a nasty boy it's like he was always he was always like tripping people over and you know he'd go into a shop and steal things and it's like that's hard to pin down because all of these people said this after he'd been arrested after the trial so how much of that is true it's like it's like with ian brady the moore's murderer if you read the shitty tabloids the shitty tabloids always manage to find someone who says, oh, Ian Brady, yeah, yeah, he used to get cats and he used to throw them off blocks of flats and, do you know, he used to stamp on them. He didn't, he loved animals. Like, his book, The Gates of Janus, the proceeds of that went to, out of the four charities he donated the money to, three of them were animal charities. He loved animals. But that's the problem, is, is years after people have kind of, years after, like, a serial killer or a murderer uh, has been arrested and all that, all of a sudden people go, oh, yeah, I knew, because they're desperate to say, I knew that, I knew all about this, oh, yeah, I'm the smart one. But it's not. So all of these are hard to pin down. People, people said that his parents were cruel, but the more you look into it, the more his parents, their problem was not that they were cruel, not that they were strict, was that they were forgiving they were constantly forgiving him for his sins. So, you know, um, to him, it was there wasn't really a sin. Like when, when he was caught, uh, allegedly, because he was never charged with it, uh, a lot of this was because his parents were kind of respect, respectable that a lot of people kind of forgive them for his crimes, his early crimes, not the later crimes, the, 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 the petty crimes. So, um, th- you know, because he was never charged with these, he just, he was just like, oh, you know, he's pretty much always going to get off with it, really. Kind of with the with the Blackout Ripper as well. When you look to the Blackout Ripper's early life, a lot of this was because his father had committed some minor fraud offences working as, a, uh, I think he was a head teacher or something like that, and he you know, stole some money or something like that. And because he was middle class and respectable, he paid off all the money and he apologised for it, and he was basically forgiven. And the Blackout Ripper saw that as, oh, well, you know, if you're smart and you're polite about it and you're, you're posh and you apologise, you can just pretty much get away with anything. So he didn't see, you know, if if John George Haig would have got severely reprimanded for, you know, theft early on or something like that, his life could have turned out different, but it didn't. He was like, you know, there was no reason to, to be... Um, um, fearful of uh, arrest and you know even even like in here as you see when he was arrested when he was in prison it wasn't really a problem to him again this is hard to pin down because this is this is him talking afterwards uh he there was quite a few letters he sent to relatives and things like that but you know um it's the ones afterwards where he goes oh do you know prison wasn't really a problem but obviously this is him talking after the fact which is all always hard a lot of people use after the fact as fact but you can't use after the fact as fact because it's clouded by rose tinted spectacles so uh that's always the problem with writing about someone's life uh what else we got yeah no so there was uh obviously there was a piece here that uh john george haig said about his dad that his dad had a, a mark on his forehead which was in the shape of kind of a blue crucifix uh, and he said he was given it by God as a sin because he had sinned. So uh, John George Haig, when he was a child, spent a lot of time looking in the mirror and kind of you know, every day checking to see if he would end up with a blue crucifix on his on his forehead for any sins. And, and they never turned up. It never happened. And he later found out in life that uh, the blue crucifix mark on his father's head wasn't caused by a sin. It was caused by a flying piece of coal. So there you go. Uh, what else we got? Uh, he was uh, devout at the church. Every Sunday, he'd leave at 5.30 a.m. He would officiate at the altar. He would start at 6 a.m. Uh, he would do uh, services right through. He would do the 10.30 communion. Do you know, which is... Um, do you know, he was very devout, re- religious. Religion, he kind of wavered a lot, but religion pretty much stayed with him throughout, which is kind of ironic, given some of the um, Ten Commandments. Uh, what else have we got in this list? Uh... Whilst at school, he developed an ability to forge. As we mentioned, he he later said it was a gift. Uh, hence, he started he started writing his uh, his um, schoolmaster's uh, rec- uh, reports, which would go to his parents in his handwriting. He says he wasn't artistic, but he believed that this was an artistic gift. He, uh, he loved creative things. He loved inventing things, and this 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 be- oddly became the one thing that he was very good at. He um, 
and it stayed with him through the rest of his life. He, as as we'll see later throughout the series, it wasn't just um, he wasn't just able to master the handwriting. He was able to master the style, the tone, the rhythm. You know, he was able to look at a piece of paper and just go, yeah, okay, this is how that person writes. So, um, oh, boat just rocked. Then uh, my neighbour's going past. The other day I was on the phone to my brother and I heard a boo, 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 horn was going really loud. I was like, what the hell is that? And I looked out and one of the uh, the work boats that comes past, because the locks near me are being fixed, there's a work boat and it's a big old boat, a big old block of a boat. like a, It's like a floating block of flats and it probably weighs about 30 tonnes. Um, they'd lost all propulsion. And the problem is your propulsion on your boat is not only pushes you forward, it's your brake as well, but also it's your steering. And they'd... they'd we're going sideways and we're heading towards the boat in front. The, there's a big boat on the off side to me, uh, which is blocking my view, but it's fine because they, they protected me, my boat, from being hit by the big work boat. So they got smashed quite badly. I haven't seen the damage yet. Uh, let's see. What else have we got? What else have we got? As mentioned, uh, he had no morbid thoughts. He wasn't interested in sex, do you know? So which which really is very different from uh, Reg Christie and uh, Blackout Ripper, which is why I really wanted to focus on this story because it's the victims are very different. The method of murder is very different, and him as a person is very different as well. Do you know? There's no morbidity. There's no kind of uh, really horrific violence. Well, I mean there is, but it's kind of different in it in its own different way. Uh, what else we got? Yeah, no, uh, he didn't really have... Uh, there was no major trauma in his early life. Do you know, no family relatives died. His parents stayed together throughout. Uh, always remained married. Uh, he had no real serious accidents as a child. Age three, he fell. Uh, he hit his head on the table, uh, injured one of his ears. Uh, they said he was briefly unconscious. He wasn't seen by a doctor because it wasn't really a problem and he had no long-term issues after that. Uh, age 10, he fell down the stairs, injured his scalp. That was treated. He wasn't concussed. Uh, and in 1944, after he left prison, he was hit by a motor car. Again, injured his scalp, but wasn't unconscious. So, do you know, three injuries across the period of his whole life. And I think we've all probably had more than that in our lifetimes. And have we turned out badly? No. Uh, good boy throughout his life he always remembered his parents birthdays and anniversaries he'd always send them little gifts um sometimes little aunt's ostentatious gifts which is kind of weird given the fact that they're plymouth plymouth brethren uh but i think that's it do we need to know any more no mentioned about him being a boy obviously he dressed his mum dressed him in smart suits with bow ties and shiny shoes uh and although he was bullied he st stayed with him throughout his life he loved the superiority of kind of doing feeling smart and going out and looking to hence he was always always immaculate you know not 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 an amazingly handsome man a little, little kind of boyish little man with a lot of charm but always immaculate there was never never really uh any kind of faults with uh how he was dressed except as i've mentioned in the story or what I've tried to do with this story is you've probably gone, where's the big thing? Where's the big thing? And the big things aren't there. That's the whole point. You're probably going, where's the murder? Where's the where's the references to this? Where's the weapons? Where's the uh, the, 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 the and everything you know to know is there. This is this is why this episode has taken so long to write, because what I've tried to do is is I've I've told you literally everything you need to know now. Everything you know is need to there. It's just I've wrapped it in a kind of a a, a John George Haig shield it's kind of this is i've I've tried, kind of told it as his story so if you're wondering why i'm being sympathetic to him i'm not being sympathetic to him at all this is this is me telling his story and obviously when i tell the victims i'll tell their story but this is his story therefore it's his perspective do you know so uh if things are glossed over it's deliberately why i've done that uh but yeah no everything you know need to know is there i it, originally the ending was going to be slightly different i was going to add in much more to an ending um uh, but as I was writing it, I was like, mm, this, mm, it's not working right. So the ending that originally was going to end episode one is going to be the start of episode two. Because as I was sitting there, I was going, oh, it, just, it just jars. It doesn't sit right. And then I realised that actually by telling you less, it was actually a better ending. By, so by just saying he was in prison, da, 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 he would come out. He'd have to start at square one again. He'd learned a couple of things in prison, some useful skills, two things that were really important he learned in prison. And this is where his master plan 
began. This is where it began, but there was no murder to kick it off with. In fact, all that began, all that started it all, was a dead mouse. And you go, right, how can you go from a serial killer who's killed six people and made sure that their bodies are never discovered and you get to the end of the episode and basically he's done nothing. He's basically, he's a polite boy, very sweet, very nice, tried really hard, failed quite a few times, kept trying, kept going back to square one. And by the end of it, all he's done is... I almost said it then. Uh, you, even if you know the story, I mean, everyone knows this story probably. Uh, you can you can look at it online. That's fine. That's not a problem. But um, this is going to be a retelling. This would be, I've, as you know, this would be my retelling, not the retelling, not the same old retelling that everyone does. Having looked looked on Wikipedia, this is my my story, my spin on it. So uh, I found some really interesting ways of. It's taken me a while to work out this one, but I found some interesting ways of really telling this story in a different way. So this one I told it in, in his his way, but each victim as well. Um I like them because they're they're different victims in every way. But I found I found a kind of a correlation that no one's really picked up on before and it's obvious. It's like but you have to look into it deep to find it. And it's only by sitting here I've gone Oh, that's why each victim is there because everyone just goes well they're all wealthy that's why he's picked them but it's not there's there's a correlation between each victim and him each victim represents a period in his life it represents something important in his life and that's so that's what i'm going to focus on is, is that uh to take you right from the start right through every victim and uh yeah i'm looking forward to that it's going to be really exciting so much work to do though uh what else we got da, 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 da. We're getting there didn't drink alcohol didn't smoke um as you would have noticed he was smoking uh did i put that in one of the episodes i might have taken it out i edit as i write so i don't know um didn't drink didn't smoke although later in life he wouldn't have a problem with people who did or drink or smoke but later in life as he got into his kind of 30s if people offered him a sherry Sherry, Sherry. He wouldn't have a problem with that. He'd be like, "Yeah, of course, that's not a problem." He would, but he, he, Joe, he'd only have like half a sherry. He never, never drank, uh, didn't do drugs, would smoke. But this seems to, this doesn't seem to be something that he enjoyed. It seemed to be a social thing because it was quite popular at the time, and you know, he he, he had uh, cigarettes in like a gold cigarette box. So you know, it was a fashion thing. Didn't dance, didn't go out to nightclubs, didn't do those, those kind of things. So. Uh, uh as a child uh i think i might have not put this in he um he was afraid of the dark didn't like loud noises uh as mentioned he's quite fastidious uh, he always kept himself his hands clean i'm going to try and put this into the later episodes but he'd have a tendency to wear gloves all the time murder gloves but not murder gloves it was just he you know he, he wore gloves all the time because he was slightly obsessed with germs uh but that's it that really is him and that's um so I hope you enjoyed that. That's I really wanted this to be a very different episode from all the others. I wanted you to kind of come to it thinking that you were going to get uh, like another Reg Christie or another Black Eyed Ripper. And like Ep 1, we'd hear, oh, oh, this person got killed and oh, it was horrific and all that. But that's deliberately what I didn't want in this episode. I wanted it to be kind of, oh, what's happened? Nothing nothing's happened although everything's happened everything is here everything you need to know is there it's just i've deliberately held back a lot so we can just because what i want is really after you listen to episode one and you go okay that's episode one i understand who the character is when we get into the episode two three four five and six and we meet all the other characters by this point you already know all about john george Hague. you know exactly what he's about you know where he's coming from you know what he's thinking when he's doing things so when he meets someone you know exactly what what he wants to do with this, what he wants, what he sees them for, where they come from. Do you know, it's uh, so we learn about their life, but at the same time, we 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 also already know what he's going to think about them, what he sees from them. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to this. Don't know how the rest of this is going to, uh, how I'm going to write the rest of this, but uh, but uh, I enjoyed that episode. It's difficult, but I enjoyed it. Right. Oh, I burped then. Sorry, I've waffled a lot. This is going to be a long episode. God, that was that was like forty-five minutes of extra mile. You've you've missed extra mile for a while. Now you've just had a big old chunk. Right, I'm going to shut up because I'm going to go into town. I'm going to go into town. I'm going to go into Costa because I don't have a generator. It's not, a new one hasn't turned out yet, and the old one's buggered. I'm going to town. Use their electricity. 
Uh, go to my post box and ask them why, why my stuff is missing. I ordered some more Murder Mile badges and, and fridge magnets and stuff like that for people who order uh, mugs. And, uh, you know, uh, if you're a patron subscriber, you get like a light, nice envelope. I'm just literally about to send one to uh, uh, Johnny Rex. Johnny Rex. Uh, so, uh, uh, yes. So that is, I think I think I mentioned you in episode two next week, but but because I'm ordering this now, uh, I'm doing your envelope now today. That's going out. And Steph, Steph, I've just got your email. So Steph Thomas, so that's going to go out today. And I haven't even emailed you yet to tell you that, that I'm going to send you your envelope of goodies. But obviously, uh, so I'm expecting more. Right. That was a lot of waffle. My tea's getting cold. Let's wrap this up. Um, I don't remember how to end it, so let's just end it, okay? Uh, thanks so much for listening, everyone. It's been very much appreciated. I hope you're enjoying the series. We've got five more episodes to go. Then the are obviously bits, and then I have a bit of a break. Uh, and then we come back for season four, which is very exciting. So, and by then I'll be fat, because I'll have eaten every cake that has ever existed. Oh, dear, it's going to happen, isn't it? I'm going to get fat again. Right, that's me done. Uh, have yourselves a good week. Best wishes. Ta-ta. Bye!